but if we'll join together this and this, the result will be this right here. Okay? God will bless America. He has. He has. And uh, what we have received as a nation from those that have gone before us is not a result of them believing living anything close to perfect lives. Ex-centers like the rest. And we've got uh, plenty of soul spots on the history and the life of our nation. But listen, the nation, the people that compose the nation, if they are people that will turn to God in repentance and humility and seek the Lord and His strength and His guidance, He will provide that strength and that guidance that that nation needs. That's exactly where we are today. The Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And uh, so let's pray again. Father God, we come to you now in Jesus' name. God, we are grateful. Grateful for the land on which we stand right now. Lord, we're grateful. The United States of America, Lord, we're grateful for those that have gone before us that trusted in you and put laws into place that reflect the values so straightforwardly expressed in your word, the Bible. So God, we're grateful today. We're thankful. We're blessed people. And Lord, we pray that we, while we hold the baton in our hands and run the leg of the race that you have given us to run as American citizens, Lord, may we run this leg of the race well make a sure handoff as we hand off faith in God, a trust and reliance on your word, the Bible, O oh God, and a love in our hearts for the nation that you've given us. We'll hand that baton off safely and securely to the next generation. Then it will be that God will bless America. Lord, we praise you. And we ask you now, Lord, as we go, uh, Come to the opening of your word. Lord, we ask you to intervene, to speak to us as only you can through your word. And God in heaven, I'm asking you, O oh great shepherd of the sheep, Lord Jesus, to feed your flock. Because if you do not, they will go home hungry. So Lord, you bless us now. We ask all of this in that name that is without peer or equal in the entire universe. Lord, we ask it all now in the name of Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. And if you will, turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, and we're going to read in just a few moments, verses 24 through 26. I was saved in 1973. In the midst of what came to be known, I had no idea it was this, this was the period of time in which I was living. It's something historians kind of have a way of putting together for us, but uh, I'll say right in the middle of what's known as the Jesus Movement. And my goodness, was the Lord Jesus ever moving in people's lives. People being swept into the kingdom of God here in the United States by the ten, literally by the tens and hundreds of thousands. Baptists were baptizing and the uh, charismatic were just as charismatic, were just as charismatic as they could be. We, as a Southern Baptist Convention, baptized something in the neighborhood of 650,000 people a year during those days. And if you keep in mind the fact that only one out of three or maybe one out of four, probably more likely one out of four, people who pray with us to receive Christ actually end up following Jesus in baptism, that means we had something in the neighborhood of about two million people a year during those years who were giving their life, they were praying with us to receive Christ. Okay? And that's not chicken feed, folks. Two, three million people. And, and so we rejoice in that. But uh, Billy Graham was traveling all over, the, all over the globe, preaching in huge stadiums, soccer stadiums, and football stadiums, and whatnot. But preaching all over the world. And uh, pre end up preaching to more people face to face and over the airways than any other person who has ever lived preaching the gospel. And, uh, of course, people were coming to Christ through all of that. Those, uh, many of those uh, crusade services were being uh, televised on primetime television back in the day. 
when uh, we only had four or five or six major channels that we could uh, we could tune into. And certainly, uh, Arthur Blessed, you know, might some of you will remember Arthur Blessed was carrying the cross up, and up to or maybe to exceed 300 nations all around the world. In the midst of all this, I got saved. And when I got saved, I don't mean I got saved. As, as, as the song has it, save, save, save. I was saved, okay? And I just sold completely out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, ended up a year and a half after I gave my life to Christ, after 16 months, uh, in Southwestern Seminary and for work training for a life in the gospel ministry. I didn't know what time. All I saw was the classrooms had them almost all, or not all the chairs filled in the classroom. Hallways were as crowded as they could be. Come to find out, while I was in 74 to 77, while I was at Southwestern Seminary uh, getting my education for the gospel ministry training I needed, there were more people there at that time training for, the, for a lifetime in vocational Christian ministry than at any other place at any other time in history ever. What an amazing day it was to live in, and be saved in, and to, uh, my goodness. What do, you, what do you attribute all this to? Why was God moving in that fashion as he was in the United States of America and in our American churches? Why was this happening? Certainly you would say, well, it's the, uh, it's the intervention of God. It's the activity of God. Well, but God's always active. God doesn't take any days off. He's always active. And sometimes people act as if or think or talk as if, well, spiritual awakening will come when the Lord gets ready for it to come. Well, that's like, that's like we're waiting on God to do something. Folks, God, we, we don't wait on God. God is not behind us. God is in front of us saying to us, come on, Lord. Come on. Let's get this thing done. You know what to do. Go out there and do this thing. So you have the activity of God for sure. But we're not waiting we weren't waiting on God then. It's like we don't ever wait on God in, in the sense of bringing uh, salvation to people who need it and spiritual awakeness. We're not waiting on God for that. And uh, so, But humanly speaking, what do you attribute it to? The movement of God during those days at that time. What do you attribute it to? I have two words for you. The first word is sold. S-O-L-D. Sold. Say sold. Sold. And the second word is out. Say the word out out, sold out. And it was a matter of people being sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I was in that crowd, okay, of people who were just sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, my idea of living a, a good life in that day and time, just as it is today, is to get up every morning and live every day, every moment of every day, as close as I can, in adhering to the commands of the Lord Jesus, trusting in Him to do the things in my life and lives of other people only He can do. And trying by a dead level best to live each moment to the glory of God, knowing that one day I breathe my last breath on this earth and fly away to heaven, or, or may it be that before that happens, the Lord Jesus Christ will come back and rapture me out. And back in those days, as it should be today. We kind of figured that, you know, one of those was as likely to happen as the other. The rapture is good chances of happening as us dying in this lifetime, breathing our last and going to heaven through that means. And so we have the whole matter being sold out. And as I speak to you today about, about this big idea, sell out to buy in. Sell out to bang. As I'm speaking to you about that, and that is our big idea, that's what I want you to take home with you today. It is a challenge to you. It's an admonishment, a challenge, trying to coach you up as best I can, okay? Sell out to bang. As I do so, I'm an awfully good company. As we'll see in our text, this is precisely what our Lord Jesus Christ is saying to us that we need to do in order to receive the life, receive Him and the life that He alone can give, which is abundant life in Christ. All right? So with that, why don't you stand to your feet now and reverence the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read two parables by our Lord Jesus. And uh, beginning in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 through down through verse 46. He said, the kingdom of heaven, that's synonymous with the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God exists wherever people are surrendered and yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay? So it can be personal or it can be a corporate as a group, a kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, notice what he does. He goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. How much did he sell? All that he has. He goes and sells all that he has. Sell out to buy in. Then in verse 45 and 46, we have a second parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great and his surpassing value, he went and sold all that he had. How much did he sell? All that he had. Okay? And bought it. And all God's people said, you may be seated. All right. So what I want to do is, is to give you how I understand this passage, how I understand the thoughts and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ about selling out to buy in to the kingdom of God, to eternal life, to this abundant life that we find in Christ, okay, and to be saved. This is what he says about it. Now, three reasons why we are to sell out to buy in it. The first of these reasons is because nothing has greater value. There is nothing, because nothing is of greater value. There's nothing of greater or more su or surpassing value than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal life-changing way and experiencing His goodness and grace in the life, the eternal life that only He can give. Now, now here's the crazy thing about this. This guy came along, the, the guy that stumbled, stumbled over the treasure in the field. He just stumbled over the thing, okay, and then buried it better than, obviously, it wasn't buried very well. Maybe erosion over time, somebody buried it before him, maybe erosion over time, but he stumbled over it, buried it again, and went and bought the field so that he could have the treasure. And then the, in the story of the pearl merchant, the parallel pearl merchant here, we find a man who sort of knew what he was looking for. Uh, and, and then when he found it, he sold all that he had to buy that one pearl. Now, here, here's the crazy thing here. If you have not yet sold out to buy in to the Lord Jesus Christ and the life that he can only give, you're going to need to take our word for the value of it. You're going to need to take our word for the value of it. And here's why that's true. It's because until you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you will, you simply have no idea what it is you have in Jesus. Right? We just don't know. Let me just give you an example. We've got, uh, we got a young man I baptized this morning ago, Jason Jones. And Jason, listen, Jason didn't have any idea. He just embarked on this journey, but he didn't have any idea what he was getting himself into. Okay? He didn't know, he didn't know what kind of blessing he was entering into, and he had to take somebody else's word for it. I, I asked him, I said, how did this happen for you? He talked about coming to vacation Bible school at this church last year, okay? And hearing about Jesus and given us sin and the eternal life that we can have in Christ. But he had to take somebody else's word for it. He didn't know himself personally. You have to take somebody, you have to take our word for it. That this life in Christ, Christ himself, this life in Christ is of surpassing value. There's nothing great of great value. And uh, another way to think about it, or maybe something else that will help you. Back in uh, 1991, the uh, San Luis Auction House had an auction that sold off one of the then existing 24, and I'm going to call it an original copy. Now, I, know, I know that doesn't sound like, it sounds incongruous, but an original copy, 24 original copies of the Declaration of Independence. They sold it, there were only three of them that were owned personally, the rest of them were in museums and things of that nature. 
three of them on privately, and one of them was selling at auction. And the sour and sold for two million four hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Family owned it. And of course they had explored with the family how they came by it because they don't want to sell stuff at the end of after they sold it, find out it's stolen merchandise, you see. So they won't know how they got the thing. And here's how they came by it, that family. They had gone in Allentown, Pennsylvania, they had gone to a flea market and they found this old painting there that uh, had a frame that the, uh, the guy that bought it, uh, he thought it looked like something that, that would be of value, the frame. That old picture there, uh, that had a little tear down in the corner and it wasn't much of a picture at all, so he didn't value the picture at all, he just wanted the frame. He ended up dickering around and paying $4 that picture and the frame. But he got the thing honed it just like you and I would do. Probably laid it down in his garage, probably sat there and collected the dust for a few weeks in the garage. Walked through there one day when he had a day off and time enough to fool with it and he thought, well, you know, I'll just kind of get that picture out of that frame and see if I can use the frame. So he got down there and he started fooling with the thing, took the picture out of the frame, okay? And as he peeled the picture back in between the picture and the backing, was this original copy of the Declaration of Independence. And suddenly, what he thought was just a $4, essentially a piece, by the way, didn't even use the frame, didn't deem it usable. What he thought was a, just a $4, essentially a piece of junk, turned out to be something of surpassing value that would financially at least change his life and the life of his family, 2.4 million dollars, okay? And this is, what we, this is what we have. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we hear the gospel, we see the Lord Jesus, or who he's presented to be, and what people say about him, and, uh, and we just have to take their word for it. We're talking about something here, and, and eternal life, salvation, eternal life is, is of surpassing value. Because we don't know ourselves until we receive the Lord Jesus, just as Jason has, and we sort of go home and we start exploring, kind of unpacking it. And we find out, well, listen, here's forgiveness of sin. We have this in Jesus. And here's a, a means by which we can rec be reconciled with those that we have had a falling out with, be the family members of others. And here's a, the peace that passes all comprehension and understanding. Here's love in my heart that I've never had before. Here's a joy unspeakable. Listen, we start discovering what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and then eternal life in Him. We could have never known that. Surpassing thing. My goodness, the day I gave my life to Christ in Joe Jean's living room in 1973, I didn't have a clue what I was, what I was getting into, what I bought into in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then when I began to get into the Word of God and have the Holy Spirit teach me and show me what, he, what God's telling me in his word that I begin to discover what I had in the Lord Jesus and the surpassing value of life in Christ. So there you have it. There you have it. Reason one is because nothing is of greater value. Reason number two the Lord Jesus gives us for selling out to buy you is because nothing will cost me more. Nothing will cost you more than giving your life to Christ but selling out to buy in, nothing will cost more. The scripture says, I called it your attention when we went through these two parables. The scripture says, and they sold all that they had. And that's what it does. It takes you selling out, selling all that you have in effect. Okay? That you might have the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus said in, over in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23, If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. He's talking about selling out. To sell out, to buy in. Self-denial is uh, not something that's real popular in our American society today, is it? Some people think denial is uh, this river down there in Egypt. But folks, the Lord Jesus has a different idea about what self-denial is. Deny yourselves. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. Okay? And then in Luke's Gospel, chapter 14... We're going to get these up here on this screen, but, but uh, 
Luke's, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 26, the uh, scripture says, let me just find it right here in my copy of God's Word. But it says, Lord Jesus says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. My goodness. Obviously, he's using a hyperbole here, which is an intentional overstatement of fact to make a point. Okay? Because he's not asking us to hate our parents or hate our children, for instance. Okay? But he's saying in, in comparison with your relationship with me, it is as if you hated them. You see? So there's a, there's a cost at, at, a, at a person level. And then in the next verse, verse 27, he says, Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, you need to understand that when he talks about you carrying your own cross, he carried his cross, you need to carry yours. But your cross to bear, my friend, is not an argumentative wife or some illness that you have or something of that nature. No, sometimes people talk about, well, that's just my cross to bear. No, no, no. The cross that the Lord Jesus Christ himself bore was his ultimate expression of redemptive ministry to mankind. And when he talks about you bearing your cross, your cross is your personal ultimate expression of redemptive ministry to those about you. This is what your cross is. Now, you'll hear me say this from time to time as your animal pastor. I'll come back to it over and over again. But you need to do something with your life on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis that at least has a chance of making a difference in terms of eternity. My goodness, if you do this, then your life takes on eternal value. It takes on importance. What you do, who you are, and what you do with your life will really matter. We're talking about your purpose in life. If I ask you, What's your purpose in life? Some way, somehow, it needs to be to invest your life in ways that at least have a chance on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis of making a difference in terms of eternity. This is your cross. This is what we're talking about. So we're talking about purpose here. So there is a person cost. There is a purpose cost because you need to adopt the purpose that the Lord Jesus Christ has for your life and give up any purposes you may have had before for your life. And then there's the matter of possession cost. If you look down in verse 33 of Luke chapter 14, there it is. should be right there on the screen. That's it. So then none of you, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. We're talking about you deeding to the Lord Jesus spiritually now, deeding over to the Lord Jesus ownership of everything. Ownership of your bank accounts, your house, your cars, your lands, whatever it may be. Close everything. You deed ownership spiritually in your heart of everything over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, listen. You've got to sell out to buy in. Now, I read about a jewelry store that had a sign in the window that says that said crosses 50% off. I want to submit to you that there's no such thing as the high price cross. If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus Christ, it isn't going to be to you. You need to sell out totally and completely to buy into the Lord Jesus Christ and the abundant eternal life that he and he alone can give. That's the second reason. The third reason the Lord would give us to sell out and buy in is because nothing else will satisfy. Hear me now. Nothing else will satisfy. Back in 1965, Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones, okay, uh, sang that uh, song. I can't get no, what was it they couldn't get no? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. And by the way, I think the song's as big now as it's ever been. You know why? Well, of course, old Mick Jagger and Rolling Stones, by the way, one day they were going to stop. But they haven't got there yet. But uh, it's, it's probably as big now as it's ever been, okay? And uh, let's face it, all of you are acquainted with I can't get no 
Satisfaction, okay. And they didn't get any satisfaction. They keep thinking about it. So apparently they never got any satisfaction. But they're not alone in this. If one out of three people on earth, and that's probably an absolute maximum number, know the Lord Jesus Christ, a person life changing way, probably closer to one out of four or one out of five. But if it's one out of three, that still means that there's about five billion people on earth who don't get any, they've got no satisfaction in life. Dissatisfied. Disappointed, discouraged, but the Lord Jesus Christ, love, listen now, the Lord Jesus satisfies. He'll give you the satisfaction that you're looking for. And uh, so you need to sell out the buy and get this satisfaction that's found in Christ and found in the eternal life that He will give you. Now, in the account here, there's there's two different kinds of people here that are finding the Lord Jesus. One of those is those people that stumble over the Lord Jesus. I'm one of those. I promise you. I was minding my own business life the night I gave my life to Christ. I just stumbled over the Lord Jesus. I had no idea at all. I mean, I hadn't even thought in that direction. That uh, 30 minutes, 10 minutes, 3 minutes before I received the Lord, that that's where I was headed in life. None once more just stumble over the Lord Jesus. Apostle Paul, he wasn't looking for Jesus. He was looking for Jesus' followers so that he could arrest them, so that he could put them into jail or maybe even to death. He was a persecutor of the church. He's traveling down the Damascus Road that, that day and just stumbled over the Lord Jesus Christ. And his life was transformed, sold out to buy in. Here he goes. Living a life of ultimate eternal satisfaction. And, uh, so we have this. One of the uh, one of the astronauts that I've read about, one of the 12 sets of footprints on the moon, is a guy named Charles Duke. And uh, he was the lunar module pilot for Apollo, for Apollo 16 mission. And so we got out there and walked around on the moon. And uh, had the fame and fortune that comes with doing that sort of thing. But when he walked on the moon, he didn't know the Lord. Here's his story. After walking on the moon, I was bored. Fame, fortune, and spot in history books, I had it all. But if you had been a fly on the wall of my home, you would have seen that I wasn't so hot. I was failing miserably as a husband and a father. Though I'd gone to church all my life, I had all of God I needed in that one hour on Sunday morning. Even the moon had not been a spiritual experience. I wasn't looking for God. I, knew, I only knew Jesus the way you know United States presidents in name only. My business succeeded, the money rolled in, and I was bored again. But my wife, Dottie, wasn't. She had changed. Her depression had lifted. She, and she demonstrated a new believing faith. She turned to God, not to me, for answers to her problems. One night I attended a Bible story, study with her that focused on one penetrating question. And that question was, who is Jesus? All my life I had said the words, the Son of God, but had never trusted Him that night. I came face to face with the opportunity to follow him. I prayed with Dottie in the front seat of our car and gave my life over to Christ. I didn't see angels. I didn't hear music, no blinding lights, but I knew what I knew. I was real. And what was happening in my life was real. The next day I woke with a, an insatiable desire to read the Bible. It cost the United States government $400 million dollars for me to walk three days on the moon, and it's over. But to walk with Jesus is free, and it lasts forever. This is this, this man. What, is, what happened here? This guy just stumbled over the Lord Jesus Christ, sold out to buy him to the Lord Jesus and the life he alone can give. And there's this second guy. This guy down here is the pearl merchant. And as Jesus tells the parable, the pearl merchant was a seeker of pearls. He knew pearls. 
He knew what he was looking for. And when he found that one pearl of surpassing value, he went back and sold out to buy into that pearl. And so we have those who are searching. They're searching. Now, I will submit to you that I don't think they're searching for Jesus per se. What they're searching for, because they don't know him. They don't, they don't again, they have to take somebody else's word for it. You see, of who Jesus is, the difference he'll make in their life. Take somebody else's word for it. So the people that are searching, and it may be some of you today, or you're here and you're searching, you're just kind of going along, just thinking, mm, there's more to life than this, right? There's more to life than this. There's got to be. There's more to life than just getting up in the morning and going to work and coming home and from work tired and fixing supper and watching some TV or whatever it is you do and going to bed at night and getting up the next day. You know, just paying the bills and getting the kids through college one day. One day if you live long enough to do it, you manage to retire. And then you get sick and die. Is that it? I mean, folks, it, tell me, is that all there is to this life? No. Listen, those who are seeking and searching, they're saying, you know what, there's more than that. There's more than that. They want something that is real. They, they want something that gives substance and satisfaction to life. They want something to pour their lives into, something that really makes a difference, you see, and something that will result in them, them being right with the man in the mirror. Being right with God and right with their fellow man and looking for that. And you see, they don't know it's all found in Jesus. But then they take somebody else's word for it. And lo and behold, they find in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that they, they really, this is what I was looking for all along. You see, isn't that right? This is what I was looking for all along. And some of you may be, you may be a stumbler like me and the Apostle Paul. It's about the only way I can relate to the Apostle Paul, but we both stumble, you see, over the treasure hidden in the field, so without buying it. Some of you may be, may be stumbled, some of you may be searchers today, seeking that which can only be found in Jesus Christ our Lord. Like in uh, Book of Acts, chapter 8, we find the account of that Ethiopian court official that uh, he, was, he was a searcher. He was a spiritual searcher, and he wanted to know the true and living God, and he went to Jerusalem, hoping to find out the truth about the true and living God, but he never got there. All he heard about was rules and rituals and all that kind of stuff that are part of the Hebrew faith. He was headed back home. Back to Ethiopia, coming across the desert with his caravan, and he was a disappointed guy sitting up there in a chair, with a chair carried by some men or whatever, however they did that. But he's there traveling, and God sends a man named Philip the Evangelist. God sent him out of a boring revival meeting, <laughs> we call it today, down there on that desert road. And he saw this man up there in his chariot, and he's uh, reading uh, a scroll. He gets close enough, he hears the words, and he thinks, yep, I've heard that before. That's right out of Isaiah 53. And he asked the man, so, said, uh, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, wonderful answer, by the way. He said, how could I unless somebody, so somebody teaches me, unless somebody explains it to me, you see? That's why we have to share Christ with others. We have to share Christ with others because even though they have access to the written word of God, testimonies of others, they can't understand it until somebody explains it to them. You see, because it, the gospel is too counterintuitive. But here you have it. This man was searching and had this Isaiah scroll. He's reading Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says that Philip went up into the chariot and he Beginning right there from that passage, preached unto him Jesus. The man gave his life to Christ, sold out to buy him, gave his life to Christ, and then they also saw some water and said, It's like Jason did. There's some water, why can't I be baptized? And he said, You can't, let's do it. And he stopped the chair, went out there, and he was baptized, and then went on his way. Went on his way, satisfied. The thirst he had in his life, in his heart, satiated of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and the life that Christ alone can give. I have a question for you today, and that question is, have you sold out yet? Have you sold out to buying him for the Lord Jesus Christ and the life that he and he alone give? If not, there's just never a better time than right now. Let's bow our heads and hearts together. Right now, if you've not sold out to buy him, right in this moment, would you turn to the Lord Jesus and pray thus unto him? Pray this way in, in, unto him. Lord Jesus, I come to you giving you my life today. I know that I've sinned and I know I'm a sinner like the rest. And I know I need your forgiveness. Thank you for dying to pay for my sin. I give you my life in its entirety to die to, to, today. Selling out to buy in to you and the life you alone can give. I give you my life. Save me today, precious Lord. It's in your holy name I ask you. Now, beloved friend, if you're praying that prayer today, I'll be standing here in front in just a few moments and you come and just share with me. I pray to receive Christ with you a few moments, Brother Preacher. And I'm coming to let it be known. Giving my life to Christ. Sell now to buy him. And maybe here today and you have have it in your heart. Come and join fellowship with this church. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. Wonderful church. You come today. As God will guide you. Let's stand to our feet. We're singing while we're coming. Come now.